Uh, Franz, you're recognized as one of the foremost authorities in the field of interpreting research, that is, research on interpreting. And you've got uh, an important book out there, Introducing Interpreting Studies. Can you tell us a bit about how that book came about and, and the basic orientations of that book? With pleasure. The, the story is a slightly long, though, because the book is not a sort of a one-off effort, but it was actually the consequence of another project, and that project was, again, in turn, the consequence of another project. Uh, it all started basically with the idea of putting out a translation studies reader, a collection of the seminal writings in the field of translation studies. That was an idea, as you all know, uh, by uh, Lawrence Venuti and uh, Mona Baker. And during a visit, I forget when, in uh, maybe late 1990s, uh, in a talk with Mona Baker, I was asked which piece of writing would should be included in the translation studies reader to give it a more comprehensive coverage, including interpreting. And my idea then was, or the suggestion was, that interpreting had grown into such a, a large and variegated field that it should actually have its own reader. Mm. And that should, suggestion was taken up. And uh, uh, Mona Baker was very instrumental in taking this idea to Routledge. The publisher liked it. And we had a proposal approved, we being uh, co-editor Miriam Schlesinger, and so that led to the publication of the Interpreting Studies Reader. And it turned out that as, as a second step envisaged by the publisher, after the readers, they asked an author to write an introductory textbook. And for translation, this was done by Jeremy Monday. And I was then approached to, or we were approached to do a, an introduction to interpreting studies. Since Miriam Schlesinger was terribly busy at the time, we decided that I would be the author of that textbook. And the basic idea was to give people uh, an, an efficient overview of the field, the target audience being people who wanted to know something about research on interpreting, but ideally people who would be doing interpreting research themselves, be it MA students or PhD candidates, to make it possible for them to get the rapid coverage of the literature so that they can move on more quickly to doing their own specialized things. And this was the idea behind the introductory textbook. And from what I've heard in recent years, I think it has been working fairly well. Good. Do you think you really need a separate discipline called interpreting studies, or is that part of translation studies for you? As we define it in the interpreting studies reader, and we obviously I continue with that vision in the introductory text textbook. Interpreting studies is not a separate discipline as such, such as I don't know, linguistics or psychology, but it is a sub-discipline, a, a, a rather um, interesting, in some parts autonomous, specialized discipline within a larger discipline, and the larger discipline being translation studies. Uh, there are some pragmatic reasons for that. If you go to a, a conference like uh, an EST conference, European Society for Translation Studies conference, it is very difficult nowadays to fit all innovative research into a three-day conference program without having, uh, having seven or eight parallel sessions. There are fields like, I don't know, audiovisual translation, and there are con whole conferences devoted to that one single topic, and there is literary translation, and there is technical translation, localization, media translation, and there is interpreting. And if we limited that, uh, the concept of interpreting to conference interpreting, as was the case for many decades, until about the early 1990s, I guess we could easily fit it into one stream within a, a, a general translation studies conference as was still possible, for instance, in 1992 in this conference that we had in Vienna. But the field of interpreting yeah. studies itself has become diversified, enlarged, expanded by the, the attempt to include other domains of interpreting, like community-based interpreting, media interpreting, court interpreting, and uh, including signed language interpreting. So we find that this huge body of, of scholarship and this growing community is almost too big to, to always fit it 
into translation studies in practical terms if you organize a meeting or for publications, like with the reader. It, yes, it's part of translation studies, but it's too big to be fitted into, into the framework of, to, of one book or one conference. And so it makes sense to, in terms of the specialization that seems to be a natural feature of any academic field, you start out with linguistics and you end up with what? Uh, text linguistics, psycholinguistics, sociolinguistics, and 100 years ago it was just one basic field and all of these subdivisions developed from it and I guess with translation studies coming into its own maybe in the 1980s at some point we're seeing these sub-communities uh, evolving and I would be quite happy with that as long as we ultimately have this awareness that we're all part of a very large family of people, a community of people mainly interested in the study of translation in its various shapes and forms, but almost too complex in practical terms for academic cooperation, networking, publications and conferences. So I guess interpreting deserves its, its own community, its own network, mm -hmm. just to facilitate a more manageable form of cooperation. Do you think that there are different research methodologies at stake? or fundamental concepts? I think if we look back to the 1990s, uh, it would still be very strongly felt that interpreting studies was different from other approaches in translation mm -hmm. studies because it was so clearly shaped by experimental research mm -hmm. as practiced in the psychological disciplines. But that has changed radically in the course of the 1990s with the acceptance of other types of interpreting, dialogic interpreting in being included and new approaches being used, sociological, sociolinguistic, discourse analytical techniques being applied to the study of interpreting. So I guess this has uh, facilitated a shift towards the mm. humanities, towards the social sciences, and it's, it's easier now for translation scholars who have also been moving towards more sociological perspectives to see the common ground between the two. Okay. I'm interested in how you got into this field and I'd like to go back to when you were about 25, 26. Where were you then? What were you doing? And how did you get into the position you're in now? I was just starting out a two-year stint at the Monterey Institute of International mm -hmm. Studies. I was there on a Fulbright grant after I had completed my conference interpreter training at the University of Vienna. And I was happy with the training I had, but I had this feeling that after completing a diploma thesis, which was basically a terminological glossary, that there might be more. I mean, I hadn't done much reading, much academic uh, exposure, and so these two years provided me with an opportunity to read some more about interpreter training, about curricula, about teaching approaches. And uh, people like Ine van Dam at the Monterey Institute and Jackie Harmer, still mm. there, uh, as my colleagues there, got me, and a good library, got me into some of the reading. And a colleague who had arrived from Germany for a year, Heidrun Gerzimisch Arbogast, uh, came very enthusiastically, uh, filled with ideas of functionalism from Heidelberg, working with Hans Vermeer and Christiane Nord. And that enthusiasm, these ideas carried over, and I, I, I read, for instance, Rice and Vermeer's book in Monterey in, in, in 1987, discussed some of the ideas with Heidi, and it was there that the seeds were planted, as it were, that uh, I should, I would have an interest in, in these theories and in working some more in the field and basically the limit would be doing a doctorate. I had actually had this idea before I left, so I think it was even in the, in the application for the Fulbright grant that I would collect material focused on interpreter training, that's all I knew about, <laughs> um, for a doctoral thesis. And then I returned to Vienna and actually started work on my doctorate and I didn't look far beyond that. I thought, I'll get a doctorate and then I'll be a conference interpreter. And it just so happened that in, in that position, working with Mary Snell Hornby, things took on some momentum of their own and, and I stayed there and enjoyed it and, and I've been working more and more uh, academically. You less, still work as a coach? Less and less professionally, but I still work uh, mm -hmm. 
some days per year as a, as a conference interpreter. Your, it was your PhD thesis that looked at the conference as a text. Is that right or not? Or the conference as a kind of text. Like that macro as text a, a, and doing a functionalist a analysis. Text, uh, exactly. It's a very innovative ideas. Still. Yeah, I didn't feel like it back yeah. then. But I, you, were, you were in the functionalist field the, then already. The, yeah. the functionalism was there. Mm. The seeds had been planted, as yeah. I said. And Marys and Hornby was very much um, working with that idea, inviting people like Christiane Nord and Hans Vermeer to come to Vienna. Hans Hoenig, the late Hans Hoenig, came mm. to Vienna repeatedly to give talks. And so this was the academic community that I was socialized into. And I liked these ideas. They were very practice-oriented. You could really talk to practitioners that we, we, we make functional texts that work uh, as a professional service and it was something that I could easily relate to. It wasn't too abstract and uh, I found it quite useful. So I thought, well, if no nobody has applied that specifically in a bigger study to interpreting, that's what I could do. What about your research or the research project on interpreters in hospitals in Vienna? Uh, that seems to be moving into another kind of methodology, moving yes, towards a again, natural continuation. No, not natural at all. It started with uh, the International Conference in Toronto, the first critical link conference that I attended. And uh, there was a whole new world out there, people working in a different domain of interpreting. And even though I haven't worked myself as a community interpreter, uh, as a researcher, it was pretty obvious that there is so much to be done, so many new things to be looked at. And when I returned after that conference to Vienna, I, was, uh, I had been in touch, uh, even before the conference, with people who were organizing Turkish hospital interpreters in, uh, on, on the basis of a very small project to help Turkish female patients communicate in hospital. And that person had good contacts with municipal agencies in Vienna. And, and when I reported back about all the things that were going on in the field internationally, many people taking an interest, they thought that we should also take a, a keener interest in that topic. And the idea of doing a needs assessment mm -hmm. for uh, community interpreting in healthcare settings in Vienna developed. And I sort of got drawn into it because there was nobody around who, who volunteered to do that study. And that then. Uh, took uh, well, dom became, came to dominate my postdoctoral research. That seems very close to straight sociology. Well, straight sociology, I don't know. Sociology being such a big and complicated sure. field, there's nothing like straight applied sociology. sociology. Applied so I would just say that this is something that, that just relies on social science methods. Okay. Uh, so the, the methods are yeah, method, methods taken from the social, social sciences, and indeed, I cooperated with a sociologist as part of this uh, modestly funded survey project because I knew I was quite aware, maybe I was aware of the issues to be looked into, but definitely not capable of uh, applying these research methods expertly, but with a little help from some so sociologists, I guess it proved doable. What about research since then? What, what kind of things are you involved in or will you be involved in? Um, I'm trying to be as broad as possible. After this, the, the quantitative survey, I did some case studies, discourse analytical case studies of uh, ad hoc interpreting in Vienna hospitals. Mm -hmm. That was still part of my postdoctoral thesis, but it wasn't part of that uh, uh, study that was commissioned by the Vienna mm -hmm. agencies. Then, um, well, as you will be aware, editing the reader and then writing sure. a textbook, yeah. that takes care of your, your um, available time for some while, but I've also had this corpus of media interpreting that luckily, just recently for a conference in Copenhagen, I had a chance to to use and analyze and that the presentation I gave there was how to how media interpreters cope with culture specific items in, uh, in, in this uh, high stress um, task of simultaneous live media interpreting. Mm -hmm. And the corpus that I used had actually been worked up in the early 1990s. I thought that this is what I would be using for my postdoctoral research. The 1992 presidential debates among uh, Bush, Clinton, and mm -hmm. Perot. And the, the nice thing about it is that I had three parallel versions, one by an Austrian television station involving four professional interpreters, 
and two more versions again uh, with four interpreters each by two German television channels. So with the same absolutely comparable input material, I can look at three professional interpretations and uh, so media interpreting Good. is one of these fields and what else the latest projects are uh, a discourse analytical project of asylum interpreted asylum hearings uh, in Vienna it's, yeah the ongoing project and what I hope to be doing in the fall is a is a larger scale project on quality in conference interpreting <laughs> okay. What do you see? Well, I guess the answer is clear, but from what you said, but uh, the, the main challenges facing translation studies as a discipline. Do you think it's just in those areas that you're working on, or are there other areas that we should be focusing our efforts on? Well, I'm only working in this very limited field of interpreting studies, mm. and even there, as you've seen, there is a issues of technology like remote interpreting yeah. uh, for conference interpreters, the use of technology also to supplant consecutive interpreting, I've mm -hmm. done a paper on that, uh, all sorts of new developments. If you look only uh, at the field of interpreting studies, to be honest, I'm not even aware of all the new challenges and developments for translation studies in general. Um, but if you look at the importance of technology within technical translation, localization, and also the tendency to sociological approaches in yeah. many other areas. Do you Those know? would be two very strong currents yeah. that, that they're too obvious to overlook even if you focus on only the sub-community of interpreting research. Yeah? And they, they're the same, I mean the role of technology in interpreting and in, in technical translation, probably other fields as well. Uh, more more hybrid forms of translational processing. Mm -hmm. Those are of great interest. Such and as? Such as, let's see, if you have an online chat, uh, there's an example if a European commissioner uh, wants to be very close to the people and, and he has this, like an office hour, but he's available for an online chat, they try to use translators to do this online written translation and they, they notice that this has to be done so quickly it really involves the, the skills of interpreters and they drew on some of the interpreters in Skik to do the written translation of these uh, online chats. Or you could ask them to produce oral output and feed the oral output into a speech recognition mm -hmm. system as is being done for uh, subtitling for the deaf now. Right. Okay, Franz, thank you very much.